Hi, so my name is Prabhan Singh, and today it's uh, really nice to see so many people interested in reproducibility and machine learning. I was not expecting this much audience, to be honest. So something about me first. I'm uh, a research engineer and a machine learning researcher at uh, OpenML Project and TU Eindhoven. I'm an open science advocate. As you can see, I work for OpenML. I have been active in Python community from last uh, three to five years. And I was a PyData organizer for PyData Southwest and PyData Tartu. And I like Europe. So what is reproducibility? Um, let's just talk about first. Uh, first, uh, uh, I'll just give a small idea of what this tutorial is going to be. First, we'll talk about reproducibility, what, what is it, and how can we tackle it by using OpenML. Then I'll give you a small introduction on what is OpenML and what are the objects inside the OpenML through which you can reproduce, reproduce um, through which you can ensure reproducibility. And then we'll get to the hands-on tutorial. So the hands-on tutorial would be around one hour, and before that, we'll do half an hour of uh, just talking about what we are going to do. So. I assume any, if you guys are here, you, uh, if, you, if everyone is here, they must have faced reproducibility in some kind of machine learning workflow at some point in their life. And now the biggest problem we have with reproducibility is especially in scientific experimentation because we have these big models like GPT-3 or DALI and uh, they are not reproducible even by a big company, so leave a small student. But there are also a lot of papers or just smaller experiments by research team who want to ensure reproducibility of their experiments, but not a lot of time they can be reproducible. So what's the main uh, reason we want to ensure reproducibility? The first one is that students can learn from it. We can ensure that our scientific experiment has more integrity because it's reproducible, and that's how we verify if it's right or not. And that, this does allow more community, community reachability, so this does allow us to reach more people from different backgrounds and uh, different countries who don't have the resources to or reach to access the experiments. Next one is about reproducibility in machine learning. So. What are the elements we need for reproducing a machine learning workflow or a machine learning experiment? The first one is data. So I think that's one of the biggest uh, bottleneck that most of the experiments face, is we don't have the same data, or even if we have the same data, we don't have the same pre-processing workflow for that data to uh, ensure the reproducibility in our workflow and to make the, make the experiments again. Second one is task. So tasks are a bit, uh, it's a little bit more, how should I say, um, meta term, that task basically means what do you want to do with the data. So if I have a data, let's say IRS or credit G or any, any other data set, what, what am I evaluating on that data and which metric I'm using for evaluating on that data? Sometimes even some papers use their custom metrics, which makes them also not reproducible because a lot of people don't know how to compute those metrics. Third one is definitely models. And I don't think I need to explain that part here uh, because that's what uh, most of us face. The fourth one is hyperparameters. So if you have a model, let's say I give a small pipeline about my about my machine learning workflow, but I don't give which kernel I'm using or I don't give which parameters I'm, I'm using, then it doesn't give you the right model. We'll also just set my stopwatch here so I make sure I'm on time. And the third one is performance benchmarks. These uh, I have added recently, and uh, these have, we have been working on recently. But uh, we think that these can be really beneficial for ensuring reproducibility in the machine learning life cycle. So now let's talk about how can we make machine learning reproducible again. Now here we'll go and talk about OpenML. So how many of you already know about OpenML? 
Nobody? Oh, wow, that's a surprise. <laughs> that, that's exciting for me because now I can tell all about it. Yeah. <laughs> so OpenML, uh, I can even tell the history now. Yeah. So OpenML was this project. It was started by uh, university, uh, two people in University of Leiden. Uh, so uh, it got started in the Netherlands and some team from Munich and other countries together by a few researchers who wanted to ensure a global knowledge base and wanted to ensure reproducibility back in 2014. And uh, right now I'm a core engineer for OpenML project and I've been working on it for the last three years now. And now we'll see how OpenML works. So let's talk about a simple machine, machine learning workflow. What do we need for a machine learning workflow? And the most important part that we already talked about is the raw data, which is being handled by data engineers, which then get pre-processed. We feed that data into a flow. So here we talk about flow basically means a model. But six to eight years ago, there was not a right definition for that, so we just called it flow. And then we train that data uh, on, on that flow and we have a run or a deployment generated out of it. So this is our current machine learning stack. I think everybody is familiar with one or two tools out of it. Panda, Spark are more of data preprocessing framework. You can include Dask also in that. Then you have these machine learning libraries, TensorFlow, MLR, v uh, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, Veka. I don't know how many of any of you are familiar with Veka here. Oh, wow, that's surprising. <laughs> so we also ensure workflows for Weka, which is not very common. So, but if, uh, that's a, also a good example, because if I, try, if I make a really good model in Weka, how would I ensure the reproducibility for somebody who doesn't even know what is Weka? And when you go to deployment, you have MLflow, you have Dockerized containers, you have Kubeflow. So, this is basically a small life cycle of a machine learning model. And now let's talk about the objects. So these are all the objects which exist in OpenML. And now we'll talk about what these objects do and uh, what are we trying to achieve by creating these objects. First one is data sets. So we have data sets and we have also metadata with them. So what is metadata? It uh, can be information about classes. It can be information about feature distribution. It can be more than 100 qualities computed on a data set. So I'll give you a small example of how do, you, how do we do that in OpenML. So if you have a simple data set like Credit G, which most of us know, you have a description, you have features, and then you can compute a lot of qualities on top of that. So you can have number of instances, mutual information, random tree depth, max abdominal distinct values. So these meta features also do allow us to ensure that if a, if a data set we are taking is a balanced data set or not a balanced data set, and what kind of qualities we do expect from the data to compute workflows on top of that. So that's what we refer here by data sets and uh, and metadata. Right now, we currently save OpenML datasets in a very old format called ARF. You can, though, download them in CSV and other formats, but we have started migration to Parquet framework this year, and we will be done by the, in the next few months to have all the OpenML datasets in Parquet. Second is, what is a task? So I think I already explained a bit, but uh, a task basically means what do you try to do with the data? So you just have a data set and you want to do an evaluation on top of it. So you say, okay, I want to do supervised classification on top of MNIST and that's my task. Third one is a model. And I don't need to explain models too much. It's pipeline, they're hyperparameters and everything else. And runs are the configurations that you have for the pipeline and the evaluations you generate from the pipeline. So if you have something like that, this kind of also ensures you to have a global knowledge base 
of all this metadata that you have. And this does allow us to do a lot of operations on top of that data, and even take that data and generate the same workflows again. Now we also allow auto annotation, so, but this uh, part is not very relevant to the, today's tutorial. So if we have enough time in the end, maybe we'll talk about it. Now, here is a similar, a very simple way how we use OpenML API. So uh, is everyone familiar with Python here, or are there are also some people who want to use R in today's tutorial, by the way? OK, great, because uh, that we have faced in the last time. But uh, so we have a simple Python API where you have this data you as users or me as a researcher, I publish my data, I publish my flows, I publish my runs, and those get evaluated on OpenML, and those are then accessible through our web UI or through our APIs in Python, R, Java, and C++. This does allow us to have a concept of frictionless machine learning. How many of you are familiar with the concept of frictionless machine learning here? So, okay, great. <laughs> the idea behind frictionless machine learning is that you can share the data easily, you can import the data easily, and you can create runs on that very easily. So the idea is that you don't have any friction between all of these processes that you are trying to do on top of the data. There's a really good resource. It's called frictionlessdata.io. I would recommend to read about that if you're interested in this area. Um, we also provide a nice web UI for these websites and these flows to make them reproducible. And to, for you to also allow, if you have a data set and you want to see which pipeline performed the better. So we have 10,000 users who have computed multiple data sets, multiple pipelines. We also have some bots which randomly put pipelines on data sets. And then you have those on top of them to generate these things. Now, uh, so how many of you have used Scikit-Long? Raise your hands. Great. How do you get data set out of Scikit-Learn? You do scikit-learn.datasets, and then you get a data set, right? Uh, but where that, does that data set come from? So fun fact, it comes from OpenML. And uh, we do have a really nice Scikit-Learn integration as well. So if you want to create a Scikit-Learn workflow only, you can just integrate that in OpenML. Uh, you can just use that workflow and publish that workflow directly on OpenML. So we do have a Cyclone, we do have a PyTorch integration. These are in a bit better. Uh, PyTorch is a bit in alpha stage, but we are working on that. And now let's talk about, again, reproducibility by OpenML. So since we have all these exact data set algorithms and flows used in every uh, experiment that the user performed, this does allow us to have reproducibility in our workflow. A simple way you can just uh, make a flow on OpenML is that you import OpenML, you have a scikit-learn pipeline over there, you wrap everything into a one pipeline object, then you run a model on a task, which uh, I already explained, you have a model and you want to run it on a task, and that already gives you a nice run object. So a run object has all these evaluations that your model did on the task, and then you can publish that object, which will then be published on OpenML website. And then you can also get the same run here, oh, sorry. You can get the same run here, and then you can get the flow out of it. What we don't allow in OpenML is to uh, upload weights of the flows because that can become unsustainable really fast. So sometimes neural network can reach around 10 gigabytes or 50 gigabytes for a simple experiment. And allowing us to upload the weights as well, allowing users to upload the weights as well can be problematic for us. So when you go to the flow, you go to the schema of the model and then that's, you have an idea of what the model is. And then you can reproduce that model in by yourself. So we do have a small team and a small community. We have around 
150,000 yearly users, 8,000 registered contributions, 500 public, more, more than 500 publications have used OpenML uh, in the, and cited them. We have more than 20,000 data sets, but today we'll only be working with the active data sets, which are around 5,000. We have uh, more than eight to 10,000 models and more than 10 million runs. And this is, I think, a three-year-old slide, so we have much more now. And we have, this is our small team of people who are volunteers to OpenML project. Now, any questions about OpenML right now? What? Oh, it's in a more alpha stage. So I have create. Uh, I I was one of the authors for that extension and. Uh, I did create it, but uh, it's hard to publish, for example, a few things like if I'm doing a transfer learning workflow. That, so you do have few bugs, but we are looking for more people to find more bugs and let us know so that we can change that. If you want to see all the projects under OpenML Umbrella, they are here. So you just go to GitHub OpenML Organization, and you can get you can see all the APIs, the main core API, and blog, benchmark suites, and all the benchmarks that we have created. One object I have not covered here is benchmarks. How many people here are familiar with the idea of benchmarks? Great, so what do I mean by benchmarks? So in OpenML, since we have all these data sets and all these tasks, what do we can make a collection of these data set and tasks to ensure something, a robustness of an algorithm or a robustness of a system? Because you just don't want to take random tasks or random data sets and say, oh, my algorithm can generalize or my algorithm can uh, make uh, something. Data set or one more data set. So we do allow users as well to create their own benchmarks. So if I decide to, let's say, take all the, all the data sets related to heart diseases, and I want to make a collection of them, I can call it a benchmark and uh, uh, advertise it to people that, okay, this is my benchmark. I think all the algorithms which work on this benchmark work better with uh, all the other heart diseases as well. But again, so if the community doesn't use your benchmark, it's kind of useless. We do have uh, two benchmarks out of our lab, which are being quite widely used. The first one is OpenML CC18 benchmark. Anybody familiar with that? Nope. And the second one is AutoML benchmark. So these two benchmarks are being quite widely used by people. And second, we call uh, benchmarks a collection of tasks. So if you make a lot of tasks for an algorithm to do, that's what we mean by a collection of tasks slash benchmark. But what if you do your algorithms on that benchmark and you want to publish those algorithms? What do you call that? So we call that collection of runs. There's not really a word for that out there. So this, term, this was basically one of the best words we could find. So this is a very useful object if you think about it because you have all these tasks that you want to do, then you have all the runs which people generated on those tasks, and then you can see, oh, what, what's the accuracy I'm getting on what task? And which run is the best for all these tasks combined? And this kind of thing can help a lot of users to select better algorithms and then use those algorithms to ensure that they can recreate them and use them on their systems. Now let's uh, talk about, now let's get to the hands-on session. I think we are already 20 minutes in the presentation, so it's a good time. Uh, any other question about OpenML before this? Yes. Uh, yes. So, okay, the question was, is there a way to recreate the collection of runs, the, like 
I don't know if you can recreate the collection of runs because they're already ra ran object, but you can definitely access that entire data in a data set format, and then you can recreate individual flows one at a time because what you get in a run object is something like this. So we call it a study, by the way, from the Python API. So sorry for all this confusing terminology. I know it's, it can be a bit overwhelming for somebody who is new to this platform, but uh, believe me, this works. <laughs> uh, so we call it a study, and uh, a study is basically we have a Python object where you get uh, all these uh, task IDs, and then you, the only thing you get on top of that are run IDs and setup IDs. So once you have those run IDs and setup IDs, you already have the access to flows, and then you can recreate those flows by yourself. So you can, right now, uh, you can recreate uh, all the scikit-learn and R and Rekha flows in OpenML, but it gets uh, kind of hard to recreate TensorFlow or PyTorch runs because if I create my custom class in PyTorch, then OpenML only gets the name of that custom class. It doesn't really know what you did inside the custom class because our job is not to ensure recreating code because that's what GitHub is already doing. We, don't, we just want to recreate the model schema. So did I answer your question? I can't hear it. Uh, you can, uh, I don't think you can modify a collection of runs. You can just create a new object and add run IDs in that object for, to edit that run. But uh, you can, if you mean that, can you manipulate the statistics of the uh, models inside the run? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, I kind of don't get what you mean, but uh, once you publish the run, you mean after publishing? Uh, or before publishing? So, uh, if... Okay, great. <laughs> So uh, I, th I have already added the instructions for this on the Discord channel. Has everybody installed OpenML and cloned the repository? Uh, uh, does anybody have any trouble with uh, installing OpenML or cloning the repository here, by the way? What? What is the complete task for this? Is it just get a clone? Yeah, uh, like just uh, first let's uh, clone the repository, install OpenML, and then we'll go through the notebooks one by one, and then we can go through that. Yeah. So shall I wait for two minutes, or shall I just start with the? Yeah, sure. By the way, in the meantime, this is the first time we are doing this tutorial for a developer audience. We are used to doing this tutorial for a more scientific audience. So I'm really excited for your review of this tutorial after that. So I've had a question in the meantime. First, uh, uh, you all can uh, first make sure that uh, you are able to clone the repository and install OpenML Python. That's the most important part. In between, I had a question if OpenML is more for research groups or also for enterprise project, and what if a pipeline should be reproducible within the team but not publicly? So OpenML, we do allow, we don't have anything private in OpenML, by the way. So the entire website code and the entire API code in the backend is available for everybody to download. 
and you can create your local clone of OpenML and just run it inside your network. And that's how you can ensure reproducibility inside your teams. We've had few teams who have used OpenML deployment privately. Uh, some big companies have also used OpenML deployment, do also use OpenML deployment privately in their research team. Uh, more than that, I don't think this can be a part of a machine learning deployment cycle. We are not even aiming for that. We are aiming for more from a society or a sustainable machine learning standpoint where if you want to create a research or a scientific study, then you can allow users to recreate those flows. But if you want to create a private model and you want to you want it only your team to be accessible through this and you want to use OpenML, then you can technically clone the entire OpenML, even the Python repository, just change the server in the back end the just change the server address in the back end and uh, you have a running local deployment of OpenML. I hope I answered that question. Okay, shall I start with the tutorial or anybody has any problem with the installation? Great. So now let's uh, open the slides and now let's first talk about, so you do have access to all the slides, I assume here. And uh, today we usually do this uh, tutorial in a more interactive way with the, where you can change a lot of stuff on the test server, but today our test server is not uh, is in the maintenance, so we are doing it with a production server, which is also not an issue, but ideally you should not, uh, or should I say, change the data sets on the production server, but feel free to do that if you want to. So. You can just, uh, first we import the OpenML object as a simple Python object. Okay, this thing doesn't work. Yep. Now let's uh, do a small data set list. Oh, so I realize I kind of uh, added all the solution as well to my tutorial slides, which I should not have done. So what should we delete? Uh, I would say all of it, but <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry for that. But uh, we can go through it line by line, and we can uh, change the data sets to analyze more data sets. That, uh, that's what we can do right now. So if you, do, if you go to OpenMR right now, and you take the data list, so this is a very simple thing we are trying to achieve here. We just get all the data sets and try running it on your notebook and see if you can access all the data sets from there. Do we have that already done? What? Uh, I added the link on the Discord server. Yeah. So once I have all this thing, now I want to do, let's say, mm, is anybody able to run the first few cells of the notebook? Any problem with that yet? OK, great. So let's say I want to do it with the credit G data set or some other data set. And if I, you can even query the data set. So if I say number of classes is more than 50, I can even do number of classes more than 20. And there I have this name of the data sets and uh, the number of instances, number of features, number of classes. So you can play around with all these data sets over there and see which data set do you actually want. Because sometimes you have all this data set repository, and you, don't, you want a particular data set, but you don't know which data set it is. So then you can access through this. Now, once I have the data set, let's just download 
some data sets from OpenML. So how can we download data sets from OpenML? Easiest way is you have all these data sets here. Uh, does everybody know the link to the website? It's openml.org. And let's inspect uh, some random data set from OpenML. So is everybody aware about the credit tree data sets? Let's we'll inspect that today. The ID of this data set is 31. So let's go here. Oh. So uh, I have not made huge changes in the GitHub repo, though. I didn't have enough time. But uh, we'll just start with the, I think that's where we left, uh, download data sets. Yep. So we'll start analyzing some other IDs of the data sets. So like I said, the first idea of a reproducible workflow is just to have the data set and see how, what is this data set and what are we going to do with this. Yes? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Is it better? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So when you download a dataset from OpenML, you use a datasets object, and we use the function called get dataset from OpenML. So feel free to go on the website and take any dataset you want. Uh, did somebody ask a question? Okay, great. So right now I'm taking the credit G dataset. It's, uh, this is the URL for the data set, and we have the authors, we have the source, we have the citation, and this is German credit data set, and it comes with a small cost matrix as well, which is pretty cool. Now, this only downloads you the data set object. If you want to download the entire data set, you just go with the get data. Here we want to download data frame. And uh, let's just call this data frame is here. Now you can inspect this data frame. And is everybody able to access the data frame right now, by the way? OK, you're able to run that? So now I want to do my simple split on the data set. Uh, in a scikit-learn style. So you always get uh, four attributes out of the data set. If you want to get categorical, you get, you get an x value, y value, a categorical indicator, the attributes name, and uh, from the get, oh, get data set. Now I just want to see how it's looking. Is anybody trying any other data set than credit G, by the way? OK, great. How will start going? So feel f yeah. Now I want to do a small analysis on this data set by exploring the visuality of the data. So let's just uh, go with the simple bar chart where we are trying to do a small sc sc scatter matrix of the class with the bins. And uh, so you have the one duration here and the other duration on the other side. I made this tutorial for another data set, so I'll just get back to how it should look like, ideally. And uh, This one was created G, 31 ID. And if you use it for the EEG sample data set, which is 1471 ID, then this one makes more sense because it has the bars plotted right. So then you have the duration of the EEG samples and that what you're trying to achieve here, just to explore the, how the data set looks like. So this, um, yeah. So I mean, now we try the, the analysis from the GitHub. Yeah. I pulled, so I yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this looks different, so I want, I want if I need to change something now. On Can I see? Yeah, sure. Okay. I can also remove yeah. from the... Oh, no. Yeah. And That's all right. Right. Um, so, I did pull. No, no, that's okay. Can you just show me the notebook?
Oh yeah, actually mine is a bit wrong though. So the one you have it on the notebook is should be right. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's a it's a problem with my matplotlib. I don't know for some reason it's not showing rest of the graph to me. Okay. Yeah. By the way, you should have a much bigger scatter matrix because I, I did make it like that, but for some reason I'm not able to see that in rest of it. So you should have something which looks like, sorry. This. So you should have something which looks like this, because that's what I was trying to achieve. But, and the code is the same, but sometimes matplotlib only shows one thing. You know, I just might need to restart my kernel for that. But that's where you have all the bins here, and you can explore the data visu visuality here. Now let's talk about the next element of this tutorial called task. So I will go through a few uh, elements. I'll go through task and models faster so that we can talk more about benchmarks because I think benchmarks are the most interesting part of this tutorial. Okay. So now can all of you, uh, was all, everybody able to run the data set tutorial easily? You grab the data set, you analyze the data set, you can grab multiple data sets and work on top of that. The second one we'll be working on is the task tutorial. So like I already said, uh, is this one fine or more? Like I already said, the tasks are basically what you want to do with the data set. And it's a, basic, it's a small list on how do you download and, an, and analyze tasks. So it's a, it will be a smaller one, you just go, I want to take uh, all, the all the list of the tasks from OpenML for supervised classification. We can even do it for supervised, let's go, regression. And if I want to print my I have all these tasks out there which do allow me, this is a bit confusing workflow, I could see that, uh, but that's where you get all the source data IDs, the number of feature in every IDs, but if you put it in a nice pandas data frame, which it's not showing right now, it should look much nicer in a normal data frame. But let's talk about all the data, all the task OpenML supports. So you can try multiple tasks here, so if I go, to this and task type, you could already see that uh, we support different kind of task types. So you can go with clustering, learning curve, supervised regression, and supervised classification. The most common are supervised methods because we don't support anything unsupervised on OpenML. And then you have the clustering, which we sort of support, but it's much harder to achieve that. Most of the people just uh, remove the label of uh, the data to call it a clustering task. So let's uh, create, uh, so everybody is able to list any regression or clustering or classification task, I assume. By the way, everybody able to follow up with the tutorial or it's too confusing. If it's too confusing, just let me know because it's also the first time I'm giving it to uh, developers. Now I want to see, let's say, I want to query the task. So we provide this API called task.query. And let's say I want to see between 10 and 100 instances. I want to see really small tasks. 
So I get all of this stuff, which has instance between 10 and 100. And uh, instance is a number of uh, values in the data set. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's a number of uh, instances inside the task, a number of data points inside the task. So how many data points, how many flows have run inside the task? Ah. Yeah, so then you get this filter task where you have all these instances. And let's say I want to see something really big. So since we have more runs here, uh, less runs for the, these many tasks. So you have less task ID, but now you can see some really big tasks. So if you see the length of these tasks, you only have 59 tasks with these many instances. And now I want to see the tenfold cross validation on that. So you also get different option of estimation procedures. So if I want to have more estimation procedures out there, uh, We call, we call them measures here. Uh, oh, sorry, not measures. Evaluation procedures here. So you can take uh, different evaluation procedures. Uh, we have, so OpenML, what it does is that when you're uploading it, it does take your estimation procedure in count, and it does take your evaluations in count, and evaluate the model against it whenever you go for run model on task, which we will get to later. So right now we are doing tenfold cross cross validation. Now you have these many tasks which use tenfold cross validation. So now we are from fifty nine to twenty four task. Now now we'll talk about a small benchmark that we did. It's called OpenML hundred, where we evaluate where we took. Uh, 100 different kind of tasks existing uh, from every domain possible. And then we try to evaluate uh, algorithms against that task. So you can also search it via a tag. So if you want, you can assign your task a tag on OpenML website or OpenML API. And then you can query through that. So there you have the task. It's all supervised classification. As you can see, with tenfold cross validation, you have the target size, you have a minority and majority class size. This kind of thing can also be pretty nice because sometimes you want to see, OK, I already have my data set. Now I want to see the imbalanced data sets which exist, and I want to train my models on imbalanced data sets. So I can filter it out through majority and minority class size. So every attribute that you see here, you can filter them out through Pandas API, but you can also filter them out through OpenML API. So that's how you have all the tasks here. And uh, for example, if I want to do a query here, I can. Uh, this is basically a database query that you write, and it gets passed to the to our database, and through which you can get all these uh, data back. So let's, uh, we have a small task here. Uh, now we already see, so any data set which you use for data set uh, tutorial, now let's do it for a task. So we have a small exercise here where we want to see all the tasks related to credit, credit G. You can also take some, wait, yeah, now it will be better. So right now I'm fetching all the tasks here from OpenML in format of a data frame. And then uh, later I'll try to print those tasks. OK, the, it's taking a bit time. Anybody else also trying to fetch it? Maybe that's why it's taking a lot of time. <laughs> OK, yeah. So now I wanted to do a credit G I wanted everything what people did on credit G data set or some other data set. You can write ID or 
name here of the data set and uh, evaluate it. Now I have all the things any researcher or a student or a developer did on this data set. So as you can see, you have the task type ID, which uh, we say what you did is uh, some people perform learning curve analysis, some did classification, some even did clustering. And uh, then you have a task type here. So we have task type ID and task type are the same. But sometimes uh, you can make it different, but let's not talk about that right now. Now we have estimation procedure. So people use different kind of estimation procedure on that data set. So now I know what these results are, results are being generated by. So some are generated by 10-fold learning curve, some are by 33% hold, 33 holdout sets, some are by 10-fold cross-validation. So now you choose your evaluation measure. So like I only want, it, want the run which use 10-fold cross-validation or holdout set because that's what I want to train my model on and that's what I want to analyze the run on. And then you have all the other metadata that you can find. So not every task has all the metadata because sometimes it just doesn't exist. Now let's download a task like I did here. Uh, I just downloaded a task for 31 ID. Let's take any other ID as well and see what's going on with that task. So if I take any other task, let's uh, go with build classification, which is based on this build data set. I take the ID and I wanna download this task now. Okay, this doesn't work. So let's just stick with the uh, credit G. And uh, I want to get this task. And then I have this task which did cross validation on credit G. So unfortunately, in here, the task ID and the data set ID is the same, but that's not how it's supposed to be. Every, t every data set has multiple tasks associated with it. So every task has a unique ID. And uh, then, you're try then we are trying to do cross validation on that here. And we have a cost matrix availability here as well. So if you don't have a cost matrix, then OpenML does not take account for the cost matrix. Uh, do you know what's a cost matrix, first of all? OK. Half of the people know, half of the people don't. So basically, it's a cost per class that you have. And uh, you can use it for model sensitivity, or you can use it for uh, calibration and other things through which how you find out how sensitive is your classifier. Did I answer it a bit better, or I made it worse? <laughs> what? A confusion matrix is, I think, the one you get out of the results, right? Yeah. Confusion matrix is what I get out of the result. Cost matrix is I want to generate the result. But what's the cost for a false negative or a false positive? And that's, that cost you can uh, account for while training your classifiers. So here, if you have the availability of that, you can train better classifiers. That's the, yes? So this is I'm not really sure about that, uh, because sometimes some people, you can even create a regression on top of this. And uh, though it's a classification problem, you can just make the target continuous, and then it might not take that into account. And uh, if you want to do clustering on it, then also you don't have that cost matrix is just going there. But in scikit-learn, if uh, classifier does allow cost matrix to be taken into account, it does. And uh, this is mostly through the evaluation. So that OpenML is doing in the back end itself. So OpenML is going to put that in the meta metadata and then evaluate. So some metadata of the performance do use cost matrix. And then you can see that. Did I answer your question? Yes. OK, great. So now I want to play around with multiple task IDs as well. So let's take, uh, mm, sorry. Yeah, we have a lot of tasks where, which are sort of private. And uh, we want to make those tasks uh, a bit private now because we are still working on them, and then we want to release them to public. 
But uh, if it's out there, you should be able to access it most of the time. So for example, let's do tic-tac-toe classification. So tic-tac-toe, it's a really funny data set. It's basically every entry is the tic-tac-toe matrix, and then you're doing classification if you won or lost. And it's a really problematic thing for all the classifier because there's no pattern in it. So it gets uh, really interesting. What? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So you can only invent them uh, directly on the, on the cloud. Uh, you, you would invent something for making a private search for, I don't know. Uh, so right now, the. Okay, so uh, the question is if we can only manage the task on the cloud, or right now we can make them private. So the private tasks here that we have are not accessible to public at all. These are just, uh, we, have, we had a legacy system at one point. Uh, which is still in the existence, and is, we are in the process of removing that. So since it's a quite like around 10-year-old project, we've had some mess-ups and which created some random task IDs. And sometimes you can get the error that it's private or public, but we are sort of working on getting it right. But uh, the, uh, currently, users cannot have private tasks. The idea in the next one year or two years is just to allow users to have private data sets so that everything associated with that data set is private. Yeah. But, but again, right now, the goal of OpenML is just to completely allow you to use it. Uh, by the way, right now, we'll try to create a task. Does everyone have their API key? I wrote on the Discord to sign up for OpenML. OK, no problem. Uh, I'll just give a small one. About so, if you sign up, you can just sign up with the first name, last name, email, and password. I have mine already here. So then you can go to this uh, profile page. You have your API key. You download your API key and. Uh, You can always refer to OpenML Python documentation for more stuff. And let's just do an example of start type where is So here are some there would be an instruction here or how to add your API key here. Uh, I think it was in one of the notebook. So I'm just adding my own API key here. So try not to take a picture of that or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you have this task, which I want to create. So I want to create the supervised classification task on data set 128. So if you want, we can just take a look at dataset 128. The easiest way you can access OpenML datasets is you can do openml.org slash d slash id, and you'll be re redirected to the dataset page. So I'm doing BNG cylinder dataset here. And let's see. So I want to submit that dataset. So Now, I have this uh, task up. And now I want to, I created this task, and it got published. So if I look at the task here, now in BNG cylinder data sets, so I will have uh, all the tasks associated with this data set here. So most of the tasks were created uh, a while ago already because it's a quite old data set. So my ta you can publish your task, but if it's not new, 
we don't create a new task. So if you say I want to do supervised classification on uh, MNIST with uh, tenfold cross validation, most probably somebody already created that task before you. So if you try to publish that task, uh, OpenML will just not either give you an error or it will say your task is already published. How much time do you have left? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I won't elaborate more on task. Does anybody understood what the concept of task is here? I thought this tutorial would be too fast, but it's apparently too slow. So let's go to a small example of what we want to do now. We have a task here. Uh, uh, it's in the run tutorial. Yep. So I have flows and runs here. And uh, now let's, uh, I'm taking the credit G again here. And uh, I'm taking a K, I'm writing a K nearest neighbor classifier on that. Let's do something else. Anybody want, has any other classifier idea? Random forest, ensemble, no? okay. So we can do a decision tree here instead. So I have a small decision tree classifier based on credit G dataset. Uh, feel free to make a new classifier over there. You can have random forest gradient boosting anything. And uh, that's how you make a small classifier uh, and train it on OpenML dataset. But now I want to, let's say, let's go to the next cell. We can skip the cell. This cell is again about making a pipeline instead of a classifier. So you can dig another data set, which we took here. And you just have a category, get a column transformer, a one hot encoder. And uh, then you just uh, fit it with the, you can have a classifier on top of that. And then you have this entire pipeline that you generate in OpenML. And now I, I have this run here. So if I have this task, so I took credit G31. I ran a decision tree classifier on top of that. And now I want to do run model on task. Uh, what happened here? OK, so I need to provide authentication key. Uh, any of you got your authentication key yet? OK, great. So oh, sorry, I need to copy it back. Wait a second. OK, sorry, just once again, I need to configure something. And then I'll be done, so. So you can just uh, configure your API key like this. 
And then you have a run which you run the flow. Why is it giving me a again? Okay, we have a one hot encoder here. That's why it was creating this problem. So since I take the decision tree, uh, I'm just creating a decision tree on this. But I have the string feature, so right now it's giving me it's a scikit-learn error no normally. So if you rather than that, if you take this x and Sorry, my bad, I did not see that coming. Well, let's, we can just take another task which does not require preprocessing. So let's take iris task instead. So we'll take uh, task ID 59. And we can run a, oh, what the hell is going on here? So we can just do this. Transformer object and hmm. sorry, I think I'm yeah, maybe there's what? Just a second, yeah. Uh, I can just take a small example instead. Mm. But basically, you can do a small run model on task from a classifier here. I can just put a better run here instead from the docs. Seems like I made a small mistake over there. What was the task 59? Uh, task 59 is... Uh, iris. Iris yeah, it was uh, Iris, yeah. So if I have it here, I could just take a small example of putting a small decision tree here for another task. And uh, oh, OK. Hmm, okay, so for some reason uh, my system is giving me some errors, but is any of you able to run this instead or not? Which was already in the notebook. Can anybody, can anybody run it or everybody's getting the same error? Which one, the original one? Yeah, the original one. If you run the 31 or 403, are you able to run that? No? Yeah. Oh, OK, then leave it. Um, uh, so the idea was basically to put a run model on task here, but because of some problems or some bug, I'm not able to run that. But now we'll go to the more most important part of this tutorial, which I wanted to focus most on, but didn't have enough time, is benchmark suites. So. Now let's talk about how do we make a benchmark suite in OpenML. So you, uh, what's a benchmark suite? It's like I said, it's the collection of tasks and runs. And then if we have a data frame, uh, first we can run. It's on the benchmark suites dot by the way. 
or okay. <laughs> I thought it's already five minutes. Okay. So you can get all the suites from OpenML. And the moment you get the suite, so for example, I got all these OpenML 100, OpenML CC 18. Uh, if uh, you don't give the alias to a suite, we just give a UUID. So, and you have all the other IDs here for the suites you can fetch. Now, if you want to download a suite, for example, I want to fetch OpenML CC 18 here. You fetch this suite, you fetch the description of which, what the suite actually does. So most of these suites are made by researchers, but if you're a user, you can also make your own suite. So now we'll try to create our own suite. You can remove this line, a configuration for example, and just add your API key over there instead. So now I want to upload a suite. So it's a test suite, you can write your Name here, PyCon, and uh, to turn benchmark suite. So I want to have more task IDs for the suite. So I just create all the task IDs. I'm randomly taking uh, task IDs for the suite and just having the UUIDs over there. So I will probably get the authentication error again. So I'll just copy my API key from here. Is anybody able to, everybody able to run this notebook? Is everybody able to run this notebook or still running the notebook and creating any pro uh, having any problems? It takes time. Yeah. I can imagine it's, uh, I did not account that everybody would be accessing all the same thing from the same server. <laughs> so we have some risk condition over there now. <laughs> but I think that was the last part about my tutorial, about how can we improve re reproducibility by allowing different objects like runs, flows, data set, and task, and benchmark suites on uh, machine learning via OpenML. So feel free to contribute more to the platform, and feel free to explore the website more. This was meant to be as an introduction to this uh, platform, which is quite huge, to be honest. And uh, yes, that's about it. So do we have any questions? Well, uh, I think he also got one. Okay. No? Okay. He. Oh, yeah, just a second. They, we always give priority to the slider, so if you have a chance to slide it, maybe print your question there, but like, if not, I'll, I'll come here. Uh, yeah, take off the mask, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the, well, we have the only one question in slider for the moment. Can, I, can anyone increase the benchmark by using Augmentation data model training and achieved SOTA? State of the art. Okay, okay so we Sorry. do have this uh, problem that uh, if you create, uh, so when you refer to augmentation, uh, you can do that. And uh, that's what we prefer in OpenML. That, but if you want to make the augmentation pipeline reproducible as well, then you basically just wrap the entire object like something like this. So you just go to your flow and you wrap the entire pipeline. So I would then wrap the entire pipeline with a column transformer, one hot encoder, categorical features into one pipeline and run that pipeline on top of OpenML. OpenML. So yeah, you can do that on benchmark, but the benchmarks are never referred as just a single 
model, they are always uh, entire pipeline. So yes, technically you can do that, but I didn't get the question completely as well. Yeah. Well, I think if you have more questions, they uh, like people from yeah. Web can always find yeah, you yeah, on like LinkedIn or GitHub. Uh, and yeah, we have a few more minutes to take questions from the audience here. So yeah. I, I have one, one yes. simple question. So then, if I got correctly, in order to use OpenML, you need to have the data set there, right? Yes. So the starting point to be using for my own project is to put all my data there, actually. Uh, so if you want to make a, a private deployment, you can. if you want to have a private data set, you can just make a private deployment of it. But this is more about reproducing scientific experiments. So yes, you need to have first the data, and then you build on top of it. So if you, because in the end, this platform is to make other people reproduce what you did. So yes, yeah, you need data set on that. Yeah, but then what I mean is everybody will have their own deployment because no one wants to share the data. And also, many times, you cannot share it. Oh, definitely. But that's not what this platform is for. So the entire platform is for reproducing what you did. And it is for reproducing scientific experiments that ac academic labs or industrial lab are doing. And we want to reproduce those workflows. So you do want to ensure that your data is always the first starting point. Uh, on OpenML, if you go right now, you'll find uh, even uh, five copies of the same data set. And that's not by accident. That's by because some people take the same data set and they apply one hot encoding, but they don't know how to put that in a pipeline. So they just upload the data set with one hot encoding. And some people, they take different classes, and they want to see, OK, what if I make the data set imbalance? How would the data set work? So that's the idea behind the entire platform, that you want to make this entire flow reproducible. So yeah, like if you want to make the data set private, then definitely this is not the right approach to go. But uh, then I think uh, if you want to make your code reproducible without the data set, then maybe GitHub is a much better option than OpenML. Thank you for the question. Any, any other questions in the audience? OK, moment. Thank you. Um, do you have any experience with uh, publishers in the scientific community? So uh, do you cooperate with uh, the big publishers like Elsevier or um, ACS, <laughs> Nature. Uh, what was the question? If I have any? Uh, if uh, OpenML does corporations with publishers. No, no, we don't do anything with the publishers corporation or anything. We just allow users and researchers to upload all of their data sets over there. And uh, we, like, we also hire people, uh, students or employees sometimes, uh, because we're funded by academic grants to scrape the internet and take all the public license data sets to OpenML. So if you go to OpenML right now, you find all the data sets which are publicly listed on Google data sets or uh, UCI or ML data on the platform. So if the, if the data set is public license, we just copy it and put it on the platform. So somebody can copy it easily. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we don't do any collaboration with the publishers as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I think we have time for one more question. OK. Uh, one question about the reproducibility. Uh, when OpenML creates this pipeline, is the seed always kept fixed? Because like we have like this Python seed, NumPy seed, Pandas has its own manual seed. Then CUDA has like non-reproducible algorithm that depending on what kind of graphic card you use, it's like produces a different output, like how is this actually handled? It's like the seed somewhere written down and like kept so the same. If you define your manual seed, it is, and if it's in the scikit-learn object, it will be saved in OpenML as a JSON flow. So you will see that user defined that seed. But uh, I know what seed you're talking about. If you talk about neural networks, it's much harder to do with them. and. Uh, in OpenML, we try to make it as reproducible as possible, we, but even we can't ensure 100% reproducibility. 
because like I said, uh, if you create a custom class, uh, I really don't know what you did in that. And if you are not uploading your code or somewhere with OpenML flow and data, then it's much harder to guess it. So definitely with this random seeds, we can't ensure reproducibility, or especially with this uh, CUDA custom seeds. OK. Um, well, one minute left probably till the end. Very short question, maybe? No? OK. Kay. Then we should probably all say thank you to Prabhan for the preparation of the tutorial. Thanks a lot. Uh,